Are you ready? Stand by. This podcast is brought to you by Breda USA, Italian shotguns that are the best in the world. And this is a shotgun tech tip from Team Breda. Hey, this is Dave Hartman from The Three Gun Show, and I'm with Tina martin Nims from Team Breda, and we are going to learn about choke selection. So before you go out to the match, you want to make sure that you have an understanding of how um, what your chokes are patterned at. So what I like to do is I take, I have my three main chokes that I usually use, which is a spreader, an IC, an improved concylinder, or, and a mod. And I set my targets out at 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30. And it's just like a knockover steel and a flipper. And I test to see what those cho- how they perform at those distances with the ammo that I typically use. And so when I go out onto a stage, I already know that at, say, 35 yards, I can use my mod choke and knock it out. And I'll be all right, ready to go. Awesome. All right. Well, that's your tech tip from Tina Martin-Nims of Team Breda. Check out Breda's B12i three-gun ready inertia-driven shotgun at BredaUSA.com. That's B-R-E-D-A. This podcast is brought to you by LAG Tactical. I've been using LAG gear for three years now, and I just got an upgrade into their new for 2018 MCS mag pouches. MCS stands for Modular Carry System and is a two-piece design that fits most double-stack 9 and 40 mags and most AR mags. That means I can loan gear to someone in need on the range, even if we're shooting different guns. I've been using these pouches for many matches now, and they've been great. I like that you can choose the retention based on what is required by the stage, Speed Demon or Locked In Tight. I've been shooting the Low Cut Supernova holster as well, and it has been a dream. They make it in a mid and high cut too if you're into that, but I'm digging the low cut. Super fast draws and plenty of retention when you need it. Check them out, lagtactical.com, and use code 3GS in all caps to save yourself 10% when placing an order. Hey there, and welcome to the 3 Gun Show. I'm your host, Dave Hartman. If you're new here, our regular Wednesday show is a deep dive into the mindset, training, and techniques of the best practical shooters in the world. What you're listening to now is a match recon podcast where we have a shooter run down a set criteria and give you the tools needed to excel when shooting the match that we're covering. I do a lot of these recons myself, and uh, if I didn't shoot the match, I interview one of the amazing people in our community that did. This is the replay of the recon podcast that supporters of the 3Gun Show on Patreon got to listen to real time. Patreon is a subscription-based service that allows you, the listener, to support creators like myself on a monthly basis. I can't thank the patrons enough for their support of The Three Gun Show, which helps me to continue bringing regular, high-quality content to you. If you dig the work that I'm doing on the podcast, on YouTube, on Instagram, etc., consider supporting the show with a few bucks each week at patreon.com slash three gun show. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Show notes, including a written breakdown of all the recon criteria, can be found at 3gunshow.com. Just search for the name of this match. Now enjoy this match recon, and I'll see you on the range. Welcome to the 3 Gun Show. I'm your host, Dave Hartman, and this is a special match recon episode brought to you by Armalite, and I'm here with my guest host, Adam Maxwell. Man, I got a promotion. You You didn't didn't tell me. Well, you're going to get a demotion next I, one we do to special field correspondent. But this one, you're the host since uh, since I ran the I didn't, the, uh, I didn't have a speech prepared, so. <laughs> <laughs> like to thank uh, PWS Rifles, ORM Tech. Vortex Optics. Vortex Optics. Hawkeye Ignite. <laughs> Mom and Dad. <laughs> Mom and Dad. <laughs> well, dude, I uh, uh, shot a match. Last weekend, did you? Yeah, it was really fun. It was in Kentucky, so it, which of course means that it was hot and sweaty and and hot and sweaty and, and sweaty. But it was a good time. All right, yeah. That seems to be how they they kind of roll down there in Kentucky. Yeah, they should they should take a cue from us up here. Maybe get some seasons, <laughs> spread it around a little bit. <laughs> it's it's super stinking hot. Like every time I'm there, maybe talk faster and uh, and wet. It's hot and wet. 
Does it does it rain a lot this time of year down there? Uh interesting you mentioned that. Like, like I've only gone to Rock Castle in the fall. Yeah. And in the fall, I mean that's prime time for for rain in, weather. in Kentucky. Yeah. Yeah, so it seems like it rains no, no matter when I'm there. And this this was no exception. So I mean Brian Corey was there obviously it rained. Right. So, inter- okay, so fun fact. So we'll get into that in, in uh, a minute here, but uh, didn't rain during the match. Didn't rain during the match. Well, then doesn't count. Yep. So I think the curse is broken. Brian, Corey, and I were in the same place at the same time. Didn't rain. The curse is broken. Yeah. I mean, if you didn't have to wipe down your guns and you didn't have to whip oh, out I your... I forgot to wipe down my guns. If you didn't have to whip out whatever sort of plasticky thing you wear when it, <laughs> yeah. when it perspirates from the sky, then... I mean that's win. Yeah, it, it was just uh, just stinking hot. I, I mean it was humid, you know. So pretty sure I didn't take my shotgun out of my bag. So I'll probably pull it out and it'll be all rusted tomorrow. But because I forgot that I'm not in Colorado, but it's gonna have a patina. It's gonna have a patina. Yeah, it's gonna look should, real nice. Should bring it to a pawn shop and see if he'll. <laughs> so check this out. So uh, Friday or Thursday, the night before the match, um, going over my long range. Uh, Notes and stuff like that, stage notes and everything. So you're looking at your homepage? Looking at my homepage. On your phone? Yes. Looking at my homepage on my phone along with uh, Evernote, which I wrote down the distances that the targets were shooting tomorrow. Yeah. And uh, I hear, and then and it just dumps. It's, and it's starting. It's freaking raining. It's raining a lot. We beat all get out. And you're like, I can't bring me anywhere. Exactly. <laughs> my phone goes, boom. And I look and I got a Facebook message from Brian Corey. Oh, I thought you were going to say flash flood morning. <laughs> <laughs> no. Nope. I got a Facebook message from Brian Corey, and he says, you're DQ'd for the rain. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, the, next, uh, the next day it was, you know, bright and sunny, and we didn't have any rain the rest of the time. But the, uh, it was interesting when I got to the uh, first stage was in Thunder Valley that we shot. And with uh, with all that rain uh, dumping on that CRP grass, mm-hmm. and then the sun coming up, it was so stinking humid in there. Oh, like just walking around, you were managing uh, fog in your glasses and everything. It was oh. pretty bad. It was pretty bad. I can. I mean, I can. Ha- I mean, I can handle the humidity. Yeah. Don't be fogging up my glasses, yeah. man. I got targets oh, to shoot, man. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's 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 where that's where it's like you cross in cross the line from the the funny suck to the like no this we're not having fun anymore. Yeah. <laughs> when when you when your glasses fog up. Yeah, and we usually cover this in in like, you know, funny stuff that happened on the range or like the day factor, but there was actually one target that um at the end of our first stage that I just stopped shooting at because I could not see the reticle. Yeah. I could not see the And target. you didn't even cheat over the top to see Well, so I- I'm t- I'm too smart for that. So what I I put those little uh, Chico croaky things on there, right? Yeah. Where they strap to the back of your head because they're the, those Oakley tombstones. Oh man! And they're, and they're big, right? So they tend to fall off when I'm running. So I got those little bands that go behind your head so you don't lose them. And then now they're tight enough that I can't I can't look over the top. So I was man, hosed. You you clearly need to go to some Travis Haley classes because. He teaches that his dad told him that you always got to have a way out. Oh, in a dynamic of adaptive environment, right? In a high stress situation, right. so you just when you just head cinched your that way 1% out your, of <laughs> your life. Yeah. Is, yeah. Hey, man, you need that back door. I mean, you need to be able to like to like do the quick head nod so your glasses <laughs> fall down a little <laughs> bit so you can see over the top. It's like a it's like a Ronin thing too, like a De- yeah. Robert De Niro and Ronin. I of course have never done this because that would be dangerous. And yeah, the why rules, would you do that? But but uh, I hear people do it, you know, allegedly. Well, I would have done it at the time if I could have, but I couldn't have because they were stuck to my head. But let's uh, let's start from the start, man. So start at the beginning. Let's do it. So the the match that I shot was the 2017 Rock Castle Pro Am, which was last now, weekend. How many times have they done the Pro Am? Is this like a fifth anniversary? Fifth or, or something? sixth or something like that? Mm. Do you know for sure? I think they were still talking about it in like 13 or 14. So I'm not sure if it was if it was a 
it would be if they would have done one in 2012, it would have been the fifth year. Yeah, I'll buy a five. I'm gonna go with five. For I, wrong, I feel like they would have made a bigger deal out of it. For wrong, five. Comment in the show notes. Probably four then. All right, so that was uh, uh, July, not July, August 18th through the 20th, and uh, Park City, Kentucky, is where that was at. Uh, it's a time plus penalties. It's a points match, and it is run on the Rock Castle Pro Am rule set. Did they have the ridiculously short par times again this year? Mm, some guys in our our stage timed out, but they didn't seem ridiculous. I heard short. one year they had like hundred second par times or something crazy. That some of them were like, about that. Like enormous amounts of people were timing out. They were adequate par times this year. Sweet for me, and Sweet. you've seen me shoot, so you know. Right. So, um, sign up and the results were on practice score. I actually signed up late because I took a dude's spot that wasn't going to shoot. Uh, <laughs> so I didn't get any. Uh, you really, you scalped the spot? I did. Like out, like out on the street? Dude, my boy Jeremy Gresham hooked me up, man. So he was going to shoot the match, but he had a uh, training that he had to attend as the instructor. So he wasn't going to be able to make it in there to shoot and, uh, He's like, Dave, need a spot to pro-am? I was like, dude, yeah, I need a spot to pro-am. And that's how I got it. Of course I need a spot to pro-am. Everyone needs a spot to pro-am. Heck yeah. So uh, so I, I can't comment on any of the, uh, the pre-communication stuff, and we'll get into that coming up. But sign up for the results for our practice score. And when I signed up, uh, Linda was super nice about it. She was like, yeah, we got you here. And um, so when I, when I got there, Linda was totally cool about it. We, uh, we uh, signed in. Uh, got me signed up for it, told her, you know, what the deal was with Jeremy and everything. And then uh, she put me on a, a squad that was open, and I got to shoot with a bunch of dudes from Kentucky, which was real cool. And she forwarded me an email. Were any of them named Brian? No. Oh. <laughs> Most dudes in Kentucky are named Brian, but none, no one on my squad was. How's that work? <laughs> it's like a statistical anomaly. <laughs> so the uh, – um, the email that she had forwarded me was like a list of like, okay, so here's the map of the facility. Here's the squad matrix. Um, this is kind of the general schedule of the place. So there was some pre-communication that I was not privy to. I did get that on on the day I signed up. So this is a three-day match. Um, it is eight stages. So three, three stages first day, three stages second day, two stages the last day on Sunday. Uh, and it's a half-day format for Friday and Saturday. And Sunday is an on-off format. If we digress a little bit, <laughs> this is about the Brian thing again. No, but I mean we could. Um, so, like, on the whole, you go to a lot of matches, right? I do. It's kind of your thing. Mm-hmm. I go to a lot of matches. When I first got into matches, they were like all three day matches. Yes, and they were like all alternating schedule matches. Mm-hmm. I feel like now. More and more events are going to two-day formats, Mm -hmm. and it's certainly a viable option now to do the half-day format. Do you do you see on the whole matches? Also, do you do you see this trend as well, where like there's more two-day matches? And how do you how do you feel about the two versus three-day format? So sometimes, so I've been to matches where the three-day format feels forced, and it's like, well, shit, we you know these stages are so short. It didn't have to be a three-day. didn't day. have to be a three-day. Uh, if we do another match recon this weekend, I'll tell you about that one. But the uh, And then I've been to uh, matches like uh, Blue Ridge. Granted, I didn't shoot all three days, but they were long enough and strenuous enough that, yeah, the on-off format was good. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I've been a big fan of the half-day format match because you – I don't, I don't as a, uh, a competitor, as a sportsman or whatever, do very well at getting pumped and then chilling for an hour. And then getting pumped and then chilling for an hour. And then getting pumped and chilling for an hour. I want to be like pumped for three hours straight, mm-hmm. shoot all my shit, and then bail. And then I can do my adrenaline dump. When you got to do like getting pumped up, doing adrenaline dump, pumped up, doing adrenaline dump, I don't like that. Mm-hmm. Like being up for the whole match in in uh you know multi hour blocks rather mm-hmm. than just like we're gonna shoot for thirty minutes and then we're gonna take a two hour break. Mm-hmm. I think that's dumb. And I hear the argument of 
well, everything is so far spread out that you can't do it that way. You know, it takes time to travel the stages. Mm -hmm. And the only one I will allow that on is Rocky Mountain 3 Gun. And that's at the Whittington Center. However, I think with the proper schedule, you can make it work there too. The Pro-Am proved to me that you can actually make the, uh, the half-day format work in, in Rock Castle. Because everyone has said, you know, Rock Castle is too big. You can't do the half-day format there. Well, Pro-Am just did it, so that's not true. And the, uh, the funny thing was, so there was three stages in, in general areas, right? Mm -hmm. So like Thunder Valley, there was three stages. And so you would think like like those those were six, seven, and eight. So you'd think you'd shoot six, seven, and eight mm -hmm. in one day, and then uh, you'd go shoot the other ones or whatever. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. We shot two in Thunder Valley, and then one over by the uh, uh, Red Barn, which is by the Sporting Clays. And then we came back on Sunday and shot the one that we didn't shoot in Thunder Valley. So I feel like that schedule could have been uh, better uh, handled. Mm-hmm. But we still never arrived at a stage late. So Interesting. Half day format. Uh, Texas Three Gun Championship. It's a big match, and the three days definitely make sense there. Mm -hmm. I think if you took like uh, you know we both shot the Three Gun Nation Southwest Regional, mm -hmm. the Texas match. If you tried to force that to three days, that would just be dumb, right? Right. Yeah. So. It's three days, it would have to be 10 stages. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or more. Or more. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I can go either way on which which schedule they use, but <clears throat> I I am kind of torn on the two versus three day format because when I started or, you know, when I didn't go to as many, I was of the opinion and I still kind of am that, like, if you're going to go all this way, Mm -hmm. you go, you're going to go through all the motions. Mm -hmm. The motions are the same to go to a two-day or a three-day match. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm all the way here. Let's shoot some guns. Mm -hmm. Like, a lot, you know. But at the same time, like, you know, opportunity cost-wise and, yeah. and you know, assets and things that, you know, that you can negotiate. It's harder... It's harder to negotiate to go <laughs> to go to a three day match than it is. Yeah, I mean, you know, especially then, if you've got like a family or something like that. Yeah. Like we're a couple of single guys, so we don't, only obligation we have is work or something, right? Right. Yeah. So you kind of cross this line from oh, it's just a long weekend into no, yeah. no it's like a week long. Well, and then you look trek. at Rocky Mountain, and it's four days. Yeah. For no good reason. You know what I, do they do? I have Sunday? no opinion of that, but what yeah, do do no, Sunday? that that is what I've heard. Sunday is like uh, a shoot off amongst like three teams. Mm -hmm. So you have, you know, and this is a little bit of hyperbole, but you have you know nine to sixteen people shooting, while two hundred and fifty four are doing nothing, mm -hmm. and then you do a prize table. Yep, like that seems like a waste of time. I would concur. Yeah, um, but you know, that said, that's their prerogative. Everyone knows going in, in but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wish we would have had this discussion on the uh, the other match recon that I have because uh, it was a good example of. Well, we can. I'll save we it can, for that show. We can rehash it again. <laughs> I'll save it for that show because it'll definitely come up. But all right. Yeah. So that's that's kind of my thought there. So back to this one. You were. Hang on. Let's let's uh, let's let's set the stage and where we're at real quick before all we right. do this. So we're going to shoot the Jeff Kirkwell Memorial match tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. We're in the clubhouse. Mm -hmm. It's you, me, and my dog. And yep. And a few other friends, Cody West. Yep. So hanging out. Yep. And Cody, then and then just some uh, some dudes came from uh, from a company that we that yeah, we know and love. A few cheeseheads just rolled in. A few cheeseheads just rolled in. Dog went outside when they opened the door. Right. I've not seen him since. <laughs> I'm hoping I'm hoping one of them is is watching the dog. They must not have air conditioning in Wisconsin. I just got a thumbs just up. The door so open. that means that means uh, <laughs> we're looking for the dog. <laughs> <laughs> So all right, back to the. He's uh, out by them gopher mounds. <laughs> <laughs> all right, back to the uh, to the match here. So match fee was two hundred fifty dollars. There were um, two hundred and twenty one shooters in. Let's see, is that right? That seems a little bit low. Two hundred twenty one shooters in the pro match. What do you mean the pro match? I know oh. that's a unique thing to this. 
Yeah, so let me uh, let me back up real quick. So this this match is the Rock Castle Pro Am, right? So there is a pro match and an M match. There are two matches going on at the same time. So there's about 500 shooters at this thing, right? So the um, the pros shoot one set of stages and the AMs shoot another. The AMs have a two-day format, mm -hmm. and it's uh, Friday and Saturday. Their their prize table and banquet is on Saturday evening, and then they get the uh, the Rock Castle Fiesta, mm -hmm. and then they're they're either hanging out with other people on Sunday or they're gone. Interesting. Yeah. But I noticed, like, because we were, we were doing our, our match cast, mm -hmm. uh, doing some some uh, cliff notes from the from the results, and are is the M match posted? Like, are those scores? Yes, it's se scored separately in practice score. Okay, and it's under Rock Castle Am or something like that, 2017. Oh, yeah. so the it's not like a traditional format pro am. Mm -hmm. So, like traditional format pro am, you think would be like golf, right? So you have a foursome. You have two dudes that play you know, NFL football, and then two dudes that are, like, professional golfers, right? Yeah. And then yeah. they, uh, you know, the, the golfers guide them through the match. That's not this this type of match. It, and it's it's kind of weird because the, you know, the, the AMs and the pros rarely cross unless, like, a stage is near each other. Right. It's, and then so the only – Interaction is in the Rock Castle parking lot in the evenings. So, which happens there anyway? Yeah. Although I w will say that it happened on much much larger scale at Pro Am than I okay. than I've experienced. But the stages are separate, are they not? Yes, completely separate. So the stages are separate. The squads are separate. Yes. But the extravaganza commences at once. Yes. Hmm. For those that partake. Hmm. I guess, I guess, I, I guess, like I saw, I saw the hype around the pro am, um, probably when Three Gun Nation was there, like my early days when I was watching it on TV. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. Or actually, I was watching it for free online after it had broadcast on TV. <laughs> um, but this is like way back. This is years ago. Mm -hmm. But like that was that was my first exposure to the pro am, and. Uh, that kind of struck me as odd that you know that it was yeah separate. It strikes like, me as odd too. It strikes me as like a missed opportunity. Like, let's bring everybody together, but segregate them. Yes, yes. So if you if you are you know if you are wanting to shoot with Keith Garcia, the same stage as Keith Garcia shoots, and have him guide you through the match. Don't go to the pro am, <laughs> you know, because th that's not what this is about. And of course, Keith Garcia wasn't there, but the, uh, um, yeah, it, I mean, it's 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 difficult to describe. It's basically like um, a newbie match and an experienced person match. However, there were many experienced people shooting the newbie match, and that kind of rubbed. Some people I know the wrong way. Really? And by rubbing people I know the wrong way, brought it to my attention, and then it kind of bothered me after that, too. So you know, there's there's a lot of that in the space, I notice. Uh, not even just picking on Pro-Am, but, like, there's there's a lot of matches or a lot of ideas for matches floating around. We even talked about one earlier um, off, mm -hmm. off the air. Mm -hmm. But, um, like... They have concept for match and certain people can't come or certain people can come. Mm -hmm. We're looking for a certain demographic inside oh. this small demographic, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I just don't know what's like. I can relate with the concept of wanting like an M match, like an, an a, uh, like a kid gloves match to, to wade into and, and um, kind of, acclimate shooters to a, to a, a larger scale event mm -hmm. at an easier skill level. But at the same time, like when they try to do that or when they try to like distribute prizes differently, you know, they're trying to put a separate prize table for people who are, you know, at a lower skill level or something like that. I, I just always feel like it's a miss when they try to exclude people or isolate a mm -hmm. group. Um, 
it's it's hard to do and I I I I just I think it it's hard to have a successful event that way when you're telling people certain people they can come or can't come mm-hmm. or where they have to well, where they have to be inside of it. And this particular match they don't tell anyone they can come or can't come. Mm-hmm. And you can be the the uh person that has shot tons of major matches and go into the amateur match and then clean up. And people have done that in the past. And what they did was they took the amateur prize table and they made it random draw instead of based on finish. And that mm-hmm. has mitigated most of those uh, those issues. However, there oh. were still there were people there that have been shooting major matches longer than me that were in the amateur side. Okay, so there- and then I I felt uh, pressure to be on the pro side because. I've shot so many major matches, although I've been shooting, you know, majors for two years on a on a national basis. Mm-hmm. But I've shot so many of them, mm-hmm. and I figured also Jeremy would <laughs> ridicule me if I went right. on the uh, on the mm-hmm. amateur side. So He'd why give me a hard so time. why are people in AM who quote unquote shouldn't be? I don't know. I honestly don't know the motivation. You'd have to ask them. I just have low self esteem. Maybe it's low self esteem. Maybe it's uh, an easier match. But there were people that had hmm. uh, several very large hmm. firearms manufacturer sponsors. Yeah, that, maybe maybe I'm showing my ignorance then, because like, yeah, if they're not if they're not uh, scooping the prize table by shooting yeah. M, then I guess then I don't well, then I, I don't worry about it. Maybe there's some sort of contractual obligation they have with their sponsors that they finish high in a match, and then this would oh. be cherry picking. Maybe. I mean, that's kind of far reaching out there for a reason, but. If that was the case, I would think less of them, not more of them. Than, Absolutely. Than if uh, I didn't know that. Absolutely. Well, the uh, the reports that I've seen from uh, quite a few people uh, have not mentioned which match they shot. You know, like we see the Instagram, had a great time at the Pro-Am, finished fourth. They don't mention which match they shot. Well, that's not in the Mad Libs, though. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the match uh, the match wrap up Mad Libs that we were doing yeah yep. yeah there's not a blank for that there right because it's usually assumed that you're sh- there's only one match correct <laughs> yeah so so yeah so that's kind of you know controversial and people can do whatever they want and as long as they sleep at night that's fine but you know everybody's watching everybody knows oh yeah it's too small of a it's too small of a group not to know <laughs> yeah well. <laughs> All right. But the thing is, like, people aren't going to talk about it in public, so who cares? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And until until the the niche or the industry that we're in talk, starts talking about stuff in public, no one's going to change their behavior. Hmm. So you can have uh, a good match or a terrible match, and people will say the exact same thing. Had a great time at the blah, blah, blah. You know? Or they can – you can have people that sign up for an amateur match who are receiving – product or several thousand dollars in compensation from sponsors, Mm -hmm. which makes them a professional, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like uh, if you cut hair for free in the park, you're an amateur. If one of those guys gives you five bucks, now you're a professional. Yep. Right? So, so I don't know. But the The transition to thinking of yourself as a professional is odd. The word professional in this context of the game that we're playing is stupid. Yeah. You know, pro is is so stupid. Yeah. You know, if if you replace the word pro with experienced and the word, you know, amateur with inexperienced, then yeah, no big deal. Mm-hmm. Right? But amateur implies no no sort of um uh competency in the sport, right? And pro requ- uh implies you're getting paid for it. There's plenty of watch me do air quotes on a podcast. Mhm. pros that are not making money, mm-hmm. you know? So, excuse me, how do you, how do you justify that? The, the word pro is something I had a hard time with. And when I started the podcast, I just, excuse me, when I started the podcast, You're I very just, gassy this evening. I'm drinking beer. Yeah. When I, and, I, and it was that cookie. When ah, I started, that's what it is. When I started the podcast, I just assumed that everyone that had, a pro on their name or was on the three nation pro series Mm -hmm. was making a full-time living doing it. And I look back at like the uh, questions that I sent, like 
Greg Jordan, Keith Garcia, and Dime Muller and stuff like that, yeah. I, I feel silly now. Well, like, I never – funny thing is, like, I didn't think of it that way ever because I came to Three Gun from Motorsports. Right. So as a as a fan – and as a participant, but as a fan, like I used mm-hmm. to, well, I used to go to Snowcross, which is snowmobile motocross. Mm-hmm. Uh, they used to do it at a horse track, which was they, awesome, they by still the way. they still do it here. But you know, so it's at a horse track that they cover with snow, and they have the guns, the snow guns out there, and everything. And when I would think of of the different levels of riders, like there was there was a pace difference. Yes. You know, like when semi pro was out there, like they're, I mean, those guys can ride, Mm -hmm. but all of a sudden the pros came out and they, they were tripling, they were triple jumping stuff that people were doubling or just, you know, you know, bumping across, you know, like the pros had a different pace. But are they pros? Most of them aren't. Exactly. So So a a lot, you know, a few of them are and more of them are now than we don't have a rating scale. Right, you know, but like, there was it like was a, a skill rock level. Climb, you rock know? climbing has a skill, a rating scale and a skill level scale. Mm-hmm. That guy climbs five twelve, that guy climbs five seven. Mm-hmm. Right there, you know that person's skill level. Mm-hmm. But if you say that climbs, that guy climbs professionally, then that means someone is funding his lifestyle. Yes, yes. So, like when I was when I was, when I was riding climber. motocross, yeah, C riders were were not allowed on the track at the same time as A B riders. Right. Cause, cause you were in their way, right? Yeah. Those those guys, you know, they didn't want to ride with you, and you, you didn't really want to ride with them. So when I when but. I drag raced, the professional racers were being compensated. Mm-hmm. You know, the the dude that has spent, you know, three and a half mortgages and a divorce on his car and is kicking ass in, you know, the whatever bracket division he's running. Mm-hmm. That guy's not a professional, mm-hmm. right? John Force is a professional. It's the only mm-hmm. racing name I can think of right now. Ashley mm-hmm. Forrest, the second one. Those are professionals. Those are people that are being compensated for what they're doing. Mm-hmm. So when I got to Three Gun, I just assumed that's what that meant. And then, you know, now knowing what I know, we just need a new name. It's just dumb to call them professionals when, you know, they go to 50 hour a week day jobs and this is their hobby on the weekend. Mm-hmm. You know, a professional football player. What does that mean? Does that mean the guy's getting free Nikes? Mm-hmm. And and a helmet. Oh, we're gonna give you a helmet a year. How about that? Yeah, I mean, that's that's stupid. Oh, you know what? You did a lot of posts last year. You get three helmets this year. <laughs> yeah. So you know what we should do, Adam? Let's start varsity and junior varsity match. No, you know what we should do? <laughs> we're talking about racing, all right? So, a friend of mine, a childhood friend of mine, they were into dirt track racing or whatever. They were fans of it, and uh, at their local track. The way they kept the playing field level mm-hmm. is there's a division where uh, if you won, the top three guys oh, yeah. who won, they they had to go to tech inspection That's to right. make sure they weren't cheating. And in that division, anybody could buy your engine for a thousand bucks. I love that. Or whatever whatever the price was. But there was a price tag. Like, you know, if you can spend whatever you want, you can do whatever you want to your car, but some dude can go in your division can come up and say, yep. That one's mine now. How and frequently that, did that, that was happen? Uh, I don't know. It happened enough. Oh, really? It happened enough. Could, but could you imagine what that would yeah. be like in three gun? Yeah, if, I'll take your guns. Yeah. If you're a top three, some dude could come up and be like, yeah, I'll take your SV for $1,000. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it would definitely change the way that we select gear for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. So, anyway, the... Uh, Kind of got off on a little tangent there. Yeah, like we got what off the definition on the... of is is, but the uh, the overall. So what's the? F- I think the great. overall theme is that yeah. this is not a pro am. This is a pro match and an am match, and some people that choose to shoot the am match. And when you put the two together, it just comes out pro am. Correct. Could be an am pro match, but the, um, the some people that choose to shoot the am match. Probably should be in the in the pro match, mm-hmm. but maybe you don't have the confidence or self esteem to shoot the pro match. I choose to think that of them, rather than they're trying to game something. Because really, with random draw price table, there's nothing game now. Right. In years past, there's the trophies been, aren't even that cool. In years past, there's definitely been. Uh, I don't know that to issues. Be true. I just guessed. You didn't see the trophies. Yeah. No. In years past, there's definitely been issues, but 
you know, once they went to random draw prize table, it doesn't seem like you can really game it that hard unless you want to gamble. Unless you like to get – maybe they, they're gambling junkies. That's what it is. Mm-hmm. All right. So $250, 221 people in the, divi- in the uh, match. Uh, division winners. This is pretty cool. There's only two divisions, tech ops and open. Yeah. I like that. None of those other silly things that take away from everything else. If only there was another match that, that did that. <laughs> this one? Yeah. Jeff Kirkwald? Yeah, yeah, I like it. It was a one-division match. Was it? Yeah. Open? No. Tack? It was Tack. Yeah. It was Tack until... Until Josh came to town? Until a certain someone decided they wanted to shoot <laughs> open. So It's but, fun to pick on him. But but in... <laughs> how, we'll talk about Kirkwald. We'll talk about Kirkwald. He's a good sport, yeah. So... Tac Ops winner, Greg Jordan. Yes. But nice work, Greg the Jordan. real story here, or man, second, third, fourth, that was a real battle. Yes. So those guys were close. Mm-hmm. It was a very close match. I think who, uh, Brian Nelson and Tim Yackley were, were like half a percentage point away from each other mm-hmm. or something like that. I mean, that's what I like to see. I mean, close matches. Yeah, we yeah. were talking about this on our our podcast, but like, you don't want to see you don't want to see one, two, three be a hundred ninety and eighty no. percent, like, like like a Rocky like, Mountain. Yeah, no, we want we want those guys to like yeah. be sweating each other, like going yeah. over to other squads. Like, hey man, how's it going? Did you? Uh... Well, and that's the cool thing about this match is you know practice score up, uh, updates every single night, so mm-hmm. you could look and see how things were were mm-hmm. shaking out, which is a lot mm-hmm. of fun. Uh, open division winner Brian Butcher. Yes, a man who a name who's been around for a long time. Yeah, yeah, but not someone you'd necessarily expect. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Like I a, wouldn't put money on him in Vegas to win a match. Yeah, I but, would. Put, I would put money on him to be right there. Yeah, like top five, right? Yeah. But if you, if I asked, if I didn't just say Brian Butcher, mm-hmm. and you had like the results and practice score because of the the Hawkeye thing. Mm-hmm. And actually named top five guys in open. Oh, at uh, Mick Lake, White yep. Sides. Yep. Um, Sexton and was Roth there? Who? Roth, yes. Yeah. Mark Roth, yeah. I mean, those, those yeah, guys Yeah, that's are, what you would think, right? And yeah. And then Brian and I, Butcher comes in. Yeah, and, and, I, and I know Josh was somewhere cool. else. So, yeah. No, yeah, yeah Brian. That's, yeah, totally. that's really cool. I mean, I don't know him personally. I just, I've watched I don't the name either, from but, the sidelines. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, no, it's it's cool it's cool to see him win a match. So yeah, absolutely. So other opportunities, uh, like I said, there was an AM match. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were side matches. How many side matches were there? I think there's like three. So I shot oh four. So I tried to shoot the EOTech. They're having a problem with their gun, which EOTech doesn't make guns, so not their fault. Uh, they Lantac had a side stage. That I did not go to because I did not have time. Amtac had a side stage. Amtac suppressors. Oh yeah, they they make cool stuff. Yeah, so I can tell you about that side stage. It was a fun one. And then uh, I watched one too many of their videos. Breda had a side stage. So oh, Breda was there too. Yeah, and Breda's was just more like a demo. So you, they give you like six shells. You could load up the shotgun um, and then shoot uh, play rack. Hmm. So their their idea is like they want you to load the shotgun, obviously, because they're Breda B12i with the already modified port. They want you to evaluate it and then shoot it, right? So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that was cool. Uh, Amtac suppressors, they had a cricket rifle, mm-hmm. the little chillin's rifle, a little kid's rifle, and they give you five rounds, and you had to, uh, from bolt closed, load and shoot five rounds the quickest. And because it was suppressed... They didn't have a shot timer. They had one of those Rubik's Cube pad things that you start with your hands on. So you start with your hands on this pad, mm-hmm. and then when you let go of the pad, the clock starts. And then you pick up the rifle, open the bolt, put in a 22 uh, uh, cartridge, close the bolt, pull the plunger back, pull the trigger, and then you hit the steel target. Ba-ding! And then you repeat that four more times, and then you put the rifle down and smack the pad, and it stops the time. Huh. Yeah. Pretty cool. That By the is way, pretty cool. I want to get one of those little timers, right? Because it's like Three Gun Nation style, right? With the, yeah. uh, their shoot off, you got the big easy button. Yeah, I want to get one of those. Yeah, just for screwing around. But anyway, so the that was the first time I saw one of those. And the that f- that was very very difficult because the 
Cricket is not made to load fast. No. Because it's for children. It's, yeah. It's designed to give you as much time as possible to stop a bad thing from happening. Yeah, I watched I watched the uh, the promo with Nelson and yeah, and he was he'd obviously done it before and well, still did not look graceful. Nelson was practicing it in you know four hour increments, <laughs> you know, and it is what it is, man. It is what it is. What do you mean by that? I don't know. It's just something they say. <laughs> My least favorite saying in business, by the way. So the is what it is means not what it should be. Is what it is means we're not going to do anything about it. <laughs> so the uh, the cricket was difficult. I think my time was like 37 seconds or something like that. Mm-hmm. It was pretty hard. But it was fun mm-hmm. because it's not something you ordinarily do, especially as three gunners. Uh, fast time, I think, was like 17 seconds, and Tim Yackley uh, did that. I think he's got some time behind a cricket. <laughs> <laughs> was was the was the fire ant the only can that they were demoing? Uh, no, they had other cans there. They did. That was you could shoot. Shot, you could shoot the other ones though. Uh huh. Oh, cool. You could just for like demo, but the uh, side side match that had um like a prize attached to it mm-hmm. was the cricket. They had like an SR twenty two uh, with a suppressor on it, and then some sort of Browning bolt rifle with a suppressor on it. But they're all twenty twos because it was real short bay. Oh, really? The one they got me on was their PCC can. Oh, yeah? Yeah, the Hornet. Mm. Are they named after... Are they all named after Bugs? Is that the deal? Um, No, no. Their other ones have tactical names. <laughs> I think I think they called it... I think they, they named the Hornet, and then it caught on, so then they called the next one the Fire Ant. Right. But, um, no, they... MTAC does cool stuff, and they and they support three gun a lot. Adam is a Adam Riser is a three gunner and a very good three gunner too, and a very good three gunner. So um, no, they're a really cool company putting out cool stuff. And like I said, I, I uh, they roped me and I got one of theirs in jail right now. I nice, haven't, I haven't played with it yet. Yeah, and then like I said, Lantac was there. I wish I could have shot their side match just because uh, I'm not real familiar with Lantac stuff, and I would like to be more familiar with it, but I just didn't have time. Uh, whatever goes, shoot they're, the. They're demoing their new rifle. Was that? I, uh, dude, you know as much as I do. Like I. Have well, no I know. Clue. Like I, I got some. I, I met them uh, by association uh, with Ruben through shot, at Shot Show, and they uh, they came out with a new AR this mm. year, and they were showing showing us, uh, or they were talking about it um, while we were hanging out, and then. I was helping Hyperfire at Range Day, and mm-hmm. they were ha- they were uh, buddy breathing off of uh, CMC's yeah. booth, like two tenths away. CMB's so I went over high. and shot it. It is a cool rifle. I forget what it's called, but um, but no, they they came out with a new rifle this year, and it's pretty cool. Yeah, they seem to have like cool stuff. I just saw that they released a uh, Glock barrel, which is yeah. uh, yep, pretty neat. Yep, got to pick one of them up. So the. Uh, did not shoot that. EOTech had a side stage where there were uh, two paper targets and then two, like, 10-inch deals at 100. And you had to, one box, you shot two paper targets. And then the next box, you shot the two 10-inch deals at 100. And there was, like, a Voodoo six-power scope, whatever EOTech's Voodoo. Did you try the Voodoo? Uh, so I got, to, I got to look through it and shoot it at Blue Ridge. Again, this, this time... I, I was waiting in line to shoot, and the dude in front of me, uh, I'm not saying he broke the rifle, but he was holding it when it stopped working. And it was a suppressed. I mean, one could say. One could say he broke it. And so he was shooting a suppressed. It was a suppressed AR-15 with the Voodoo on there, so I did not get to look through it because the guy was screwing with it. And at that time, I was like, you know what? I've been here for like 30 minutes already. I'm hungry going to be hangry pretty soon so i was like hey guys i'll come back and then i totally forgot to come back unfortunately because it looked like a fun side stage i mean obviously i have i have an optics bias um but um we have seen some voodoos at uh at my first, first focal point yes which i like which i'm not very used to so when when looking through it and zooming through the range it looks odd to me yep not that it's a bad thing it just looks different Yep. Because that's not what I'm used to. Yeah, I have about five shadow accounts that I use to <laughs> drop that hint to Vortex on a weekly basis. <laughs> the, first vocal plane? The, the, hey, you guys, you should come out with first vocal plane. <laughs> One to six. Come on now. So they they had a Ruger 1022 in a Magpul Hunter stock Yeah. with an EOTech, I think it's XP2 on top. Yeah. 
uh, and it was it was like the uh, Taxol Ten Ring. 1022, you know, so it was a really nice 1022. Mm-hmm. And then it had a suppressor on the end that was a Q suppressor, <gasps> a Q erector set. Yeah, and that was the first time I'd ever seen one of those in person. And so since uh, one dude was, like, messing with the rifle, the other dude was, like, trying to distract me, you know? I'm like, mm-hmm. no, it's, it's cool, dude. I don't mind waiting. And he's like, hey, look at this. And he's, like, juggling and stuff. Did, did they have the fix there? No, dude. They just had the suppressor. So, just that? Oh. So they, he pulls the suppressor off, yeah. hands it to me. That thing was like holding an empty water bottle. It was really? so stinking light. Like it's indescribable how light this thing was. Yeah, there. Actually, I just described it. It's like holding an empty water bottle. Yeah, if you could put baffles in your water bottle. Yeah. It was crazy. And then you know you can take them apart because it's the erector thing, and then like yeah. one piece was serialized. Yeah. And everything else was just add-ons to that. Mm-hmm. It was really cool. I was super impressed with how light that thing was. And then he let me shoot that. And, uh, you know, quite, quite like a suppressed 1022. Um, and if you've ever shot a suppressed 1022, the loudest thing is the action going clack, clack, right? Mm-hmm. So it was really cool. Uh, one thing I will say, though, is that uh, when you get a cheek weld on the Magpul um, Hunter stock, you're looking over the receiver of the 1022. And they designed it that way, right? So you look through the iron sights. Mm-hmm. So if you're going to put an EOTech XP2 on there, you need a cheek riser. Yeah. So it was kind of like you're holding your your head off the rifle. Yeah. Like just rest your chin on there, <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> and then take your shots that way. So, but but I really like the uh, really like the Magpul stock. The uh, um, Taxol 1022 was cool. Mm-hmm. That Q was awesome. Mm-hmm. And you know, shooting suppress is always fun. Yeah. Once you uh, once you get the suppressor bug, it's uh, it's a terrible terrible drug. Yeah, yeah. So those were the uh, the other opportunities. Um, well, that's not all of them. I guess you'd want to say that the uh, the I'm Rock Castle sure. parking lot is I'm another pre- opportunity. I'm pretty sure that at the Armalite was there tuning up rifles. Yeah, so um, that's that's a good thing. So there there's a lot of vendors in the uh, parking lot. Mm-hmm. There, so the so Voodoo was there with mm-hmm. their new three gun bag, was smoking good deals on their three gun bags, mm-hmm. and they sold all of them, all that they brought, completely gone. True Spec was there; they had a bunch of their clothes. RCI X Rail was there, Armalite, uh, Devil Dog Arms, Brady USA. Um, what's Donny Flows? Stage, stage Zero. zero. Mm-hmm. Excuse me, Stage Zero was there. Donnie's a cool dude, so it's good to see him. Um, Gamma Leal, I think it's what it's called. Shooting Supply was there, and uh, I bought a bunch of nine millimeter from them. Which oh, is that cool. place with the semi trailer. Yeah, does all the shotgun stuff. Yeah, yeah. DJ DJ uh, Petro calls it uh, Gamil, but I think it's Gamma Leal. According, I don't know how they say it in Kentucky, but it's spelled Gamma Leal. No yeah, clue. just because they say it that way in Kentucky doesn't mean that's. <laughs> We've been over that. Exactly. Versailles. <laughs> Versailles. Uh, and there is one more person there that I'm blanking on. I can't remember who that was. But, yeah, so there's there's quite a few vendors around the place. And, dude, Armalite had, like, smoking deals on, on stuff. It was ridiculous. Like, upper-lower receiver set for an AR-15 was, like, 125. Mm-hmm. And Upper-lower? Upper and lower. Nah. Receiver set 125. Yeah. Really? The Armalite one with like the big line on it. Did you score me one? No. <laughs> it's complicated. And then the uh, the AR10s, 225. Whole receiver sets. Wow. Yeah. It was crazy. Wow. Never to be repeated. Like you couldn't go and get that right now. Like they, they had. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That ain't. They had a whole trailer full of stuff, dude. They sold a ton of stuff. They sold a ton of rifles out of there, ton of uppers. The upper receivers. I wasn't allowed to uh, mention the price in social media. It was only for people that were there, and it was ridiculous. Oh, yeah. Whole yeah. three-gun upper receivers. Yep. The, um, God, what else did they have? They had, like, some scratch-and-dent rifles, which is one of those <coughs> ones where you're like, where's the scratch, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, they call that overstock. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I mean, it, it was it was ridiculous. It was like, Jesus. Well, I was intrigued. You were saying they were doing uh, tune-ups on... Oh, yeah, so tuning. check this out. So uh, uh, got, uh, one of the dudes that listens to the show, uh, John, bought a rifle, 
and Greg Jordan and Rick Torres to uh, an arm and Nexus shooter go over to the uh, siding bay with him. They take his scope off of his rifle, put it on the arm light, and they, um, you know, he, zero, uh, they drill out the, uh, the muzzle brake for him, mm-hmm. adjust the gas block, and hand it to him. Like, how does this feel? And he's like, oh, it's great. And then they... Now, do they actually, like, go through the, the process with the gas block, or do they just yes. know that it's one and a half turns out and they just No, they it? went through the process with the gas block. Because really? every rifle's different. Really? And then uh, they uh, lock tied it or whatever they do. I don't know if they lock tied it, but they lock it down with the, uh, the nut there. Yeah. Uh, they zeroed it with John, and then he shot the rest of the match with that rifle. Yeah, so that's, that's super cool to me. Uh, having done retail for a long time, I've sold a ton of Armalite rifles. I've sold a ton of JP rifles. I've sold Seekins and Cobalt and all of them. These highly, you know, high performance rifles with mm-hmm. with great degrees of adjustability to get dialed in perfectly. Mm-hmm. And I know that ninety percent of them that walk out the door will never reach that level of performance because the, oh, yeah. the owner just either doesn't know how or yeah. can't be bothered to. So when you when you started saying that they were doing tune-ups at the range, I thought that was super cool. Yeah, and if because, you bought a comp there, they would do the same thing. Because it's a completely different rifle. My, my PWS yeah. on on setting one or two, you know, or, you know, when I shoot it on three, it's a completely different rifle. Mm-hmm. And all you had to do was make that one little adjustment, and it's a completely different gun, and it's a completely different shooting experience. Yeah, so. absolutely. Well, and think of the the impact and the um, the lasting story of Greg Jordan tuned my rifle up. Right. Right. You know, uh, the dude. Greg, Greg Jordan touched my the, rifle. The team. Yeah. <laughs> the team captain <laughs> and my hand right here. <laughs> <laughs> The team captain of, Never of Armalite, it. this rifle that I bought, tuned this rifle for me. That's that's really that cool. Yeah. That's really cool. Uh, yeah, that w- that was a really good idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought it was a good idea too. Every every now and then, Jeremy has good ideas. <laughs> Once in a while, I imagine. Yeah. To 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 get to where he's at. He listens to these, so I gotta dig him a little bit. So yeah, that was that was pretty cool. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because that was another good opportunity. And as always, you know, one thing I've noticed is uh, Mark Roth leaves with more shotguns than he comes with. You know, if you're a shotgun gunsmith, that's that's the cross you bear. Well, I mean, it, Blair, it's, it's Blair good, Blair right? Steinies of Hawkeye Ordnance, he's the same way. Yeah. Always mule in shotguns. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's easy to do, right? You see someone's shotgun go down, like, oh, you know, you're having some problems. I think I can fix that. Yep. But, so. Yep. Or, I mean, just save it. You know, oh, hey, man, you're going to be there. I don't have to ship it. Yeah. So what would you say the flavor of the match is? So the flavor of the match, you know, there's there's a couple things that I would say. One is the accessibility to new shooters, right? Mm-hmm. That's why they have the AM, right? I'm only doing the recon on the pro here. Maybe I'll reach out to an AM and see if they want to uh, participate in this so we can get kind of their feel for the match. But so there's the, uh, there's the large... Um, migration of three gunners to Kentucky. There's 500 people there shooting three Migration? Like, like they actually move there to live? Uh, yes. No. No. So like there's three like, gunners like in for Kentucky. A census. I will find a career. Like for a census when, uh, when Jesus and Mary got on the donkey and headed in. <laughs> oh, they have to go back to Kentucky Could, to be counted? Yes. As three gunners. It's like you self-identify <laughs> as, a, as a Texas three gunner, but you have to go back to Kentucky. That's to where be they're counted. counting people. Yeah, right? So it's... <laughs> Like a Mecca, right? <laughs> Everyone faces uh, Park City at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and prays. I mean, I know I do. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the point is, like, this, this is a large event. It's a big deal for 4-3 uh, gun, right? Mm-hmm. And I would say because of the volume of shooters, for sure, the volume of stages, there's two matches going on, right? Mm-hmm. So you've got uh, several... Staff, you know how difficult it is to staff one match, not try to do two on the same day in the same place, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so that must be some really good pizza that they order, <laughs> right? So for s- scale, first of all, right? Um, the now this is the first year that Brian Corey was building stages out there, and all then right. Mike Sexton was the range ma- or range match director. 
Um, Not the first rodeo for either of those two no, clowns. No, no. Very well versed in running matches. Chad Francis was the range master. Chad Francis is very well versed in running matches. David Power was there. I have no clue what David's role was, but he had a radio, so he must be important. <laughs> well, I give those away pretty cheap. So <laughs> wait, so so hang on, let's 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 not back Mike, out. That's not a dig on David Power, right? No, so no, I no. just don't know what his actual title was. So right, he was Some, doing several, sometimes those several are the important most important things. guys. Yeah, the cool. bag man. Yeah, right? he's yeah he's like the NSA. Of, he's the guy of, that takes the cash from the. Uh, the rich man, and gives it to the kidnappers so he can get his daughter back. He's the bag man. I feel like you were shorted in experience, though, if David Power wasn't ROing a stage so we're he could yell We're coming hit. to that. We're okay, coming good. to that. But I, I am confused. So so uh, Mike was match director. Correct. Francis was range master. Range master. And Corey was match designer. Yeah, range builder, dude. Range builder. It's broken. Please come fix it, guy. Correct. Yeah, he's yes. range runner, right? Um, range all- runner. I like that. <laughs> That's a good one, right? Also, range uh, runner stage seven. <laughs> Brian Corey's got a you know trailer full of steel, you know, and and Brian's sort of set up this niche for himself where he travels uh, two matches, mm-hmm. brings his shit, mm-hmm. and sets up a Corey style match, and then uh, fixes anything that breaks, right? And seems to do pretty well at it, like the. Uh, uh, did the, the pro am? He did Texas Three Gun Championship, and he did uh, um, Dylan and Corinne's match. Was the uh, shoot for gold? Thank you, shoot for gold match. So uh, I shot two of those, and they had a very Corey feel to it. Now I will also say, speaking of match flavor, this is if you've been to a Three Gun Nation match, this would feel familiar because there are um, roped fault lines. Well, now you're just buttering me up. No, there are rope fault lines. There are clear painted, fresh painted start boxes. It's not like Blue Ridge where they just throw steel out there and everything. Are they multiple St- colors? Steel's painted between shooters. Slug or pistol Steel's option. Steel's painted between shooters? I'm sorry, not shooters, squads. Okay. Um, slug or pistol option. That sounds option. painful. <laughs> slug or pistol option is painted half blue, half white. So you know it's an option. Those are all my favorite things. Yeah, it was great, it, but without all of the other BS that comes with a Three Gun Nation match as far as, like, goofy rules and and other sort of things. Says you. I tried to score a Three Gun Nation <laughs> match one time on practice score, and I had to end, end the tablet yeah, off. It's different. And I was the youngest it's person on the squad. It's different. It's Yeah, it's different. So um, clean, well-run stages that looked like thought and effort was put into them. They didn't just show up. Drag a bunch of shit out of the tobacco barn, and then uh, and then set it on the stages. Right? Mm-hmm. These, these were clean, well thought out, and there was a start and a finish to each stage. And you started with your rifle, or excuse me, you started with your pistol or your shotgun, mm-hmm. and then you shot your rifle. And by the time you were done shooting your rifle, your pistol and your shotgun were cleared, and it was back on the table waiting for you. It was a uh, clean, smooth running match. Mm-hmm. Right? And there were were plenty of options to uh, to satisfy you. However, not as many options as you would think, if that makes any sense. <laughs> so, not as many match- options as I set up? <laughs> uh, oh, you haven't even looked at I've only at shot it, one so. of your locals. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, like, these are pistol or shotgun uh, targets, right? And to me, it was like, well, there's not even an option there. It's a shotgun target. Right. And then, but somebody would come through and shoot it with a pistol. But I've seen video of, of a lot of people shooting it with pistol. So there wasn't a, an array though. And this may be like me reaching maturity as a shooter or something. <gasps> but there wasn't an array where I thought, gosh, which one am I going to shoot here? It was just all very clear. Well, Dave's all grown up. <laughs> <laughs> so, um,. So oh. there, but there wasn't. So there wasn't the all rifle, all pistol, all shotgun stage, or was there? Funny you should mention that. There was an all shotgun stage. Just there one. Was not an all rifle stage. There was not an all pistol stage. Was there an all pistol stage? No, there wasn't. Hmm. Interesting. Uh huh. So it's traditional in that sense, right? Because traditionally, there have been all shotgun stages and matches, and that's where they got the all rifle and all pistol, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and then then the matches were consumed by one gun stages. Yes, they keep so. Going. All right, so where are we at? Now? We've discussed that one. So then I will say that uh, also the match flavor is the huge Rock Castle party in the uh, parking lot of the hotel. Yes, which I participated in on night one. And, yeah, uh, that's what I heard. <laughs> it took me an hour to get from my truck to the front door. It's tough being popular. <laughs> uh, I passed a group of ladies that were heading toward a booth that I should probably not name. And they were like, we're getting tequila shots. And then... Now you're just making stuff up. No. That didn't happen. No, it did. Ask Keith Clevenger. He was right there with me. That's, and that's not were, even a real name. You made that up. <laughs> they were trying to get Heath and I to take uh, tequila shots with them. And no, exactly. We were like, nope, 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 because Heath's got a RO and I was gonna shoot. And uh, there's not that many girls in three gun, and the ones that the are are too classy for that. <laughs> Both are not true. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll tell you who it was afterwards. So the uh, they were like, just one shot, and then Heath goes, "There's no such thing as one shot of tequila." That's not, yeah. I don't even drink. I know so that's not a Heath thing. So then Heath and I sat on the tailgate. We were BSing for a while. They took their shots. They left. Who came back? That group to do more shots of tequila. There's never. There's no such thing as one shot of tequila, so don't even try. That's what I'm saying. But can I get you that worm at the bottom of the bottle? You want to shoot a match. All right. So what was the terrain like? Dude, let me tell you about the terrain. So this, for the pros, was a natural terrain match. And by natural, I mean they had to mow the grass, so we weren't running up on, you know, grass through our crotches, and we could see where we were going. And they we were, didn't they didn't pillage the land with D6s? We would run through the trees. Nice. Uh, up hills, down hills, we had to run through, like, a man-made pipe that was not in a bay. Um, man-made pipe. I've heard reference to this pipe. I haven't. It's just a I'm, plastic pipe, hard. like, you know, four foot in diameter that you got to go through. Adam Reiser said he could duck his head and run. Which he probably could. That's what he said. Uh, there was so one was stage that was in a bay. It was the last stage of shot of the match, but you started out in a bay. You shot a 50-yard plate rack, two 50-yard poppers. Mm -hmm. They were painted orange. Yes, they were colorful. And then five paper. Then you dumped your rifle, picked up your shotgun, and then ran into the trees. Hmm. So... That one gets half credit as a terrain match. So I would have to say it was large, largely natural terrain. But they did mow the grass, so I don't know if that counts. Oh, bonus. You can mow. You can mow. You just <laughs> <clears throat> you cannot puncture the pan yes. of of the dirt. The terra firma. Yeah. Once so you... bonus, Brian Corey came up to me, and he's like, hey, man, did you notice I took out all those roots? <laughs> <laughs> he child proofed it for me. He child proofed you. it for me. <laughs> so he uh, he spent like a ton of time going through the roots. And he, he even said that I found, I think I found the route that you tripped on and I took it out. And that was nowhere near the stage that we were shooting. So he went and found the route that that I tripped on at Blue Ridge, DQ'd on, and then multiple other people tripped on and, and one actually hurt themselves. And uh, he actually took it out. Which is good because did, that's all I wanted was. Did did they put it on display at the NRA museum? <laughs> he said he was he's going to give it to me, but I forgot which one it was. I was like, dude, you could just give me. No, he didn't. He, that's what he said. <sighs> but he's going to so, sell that on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, uh, the roots that were left there were painted orange. Mm. If there was a root or like a stump or something like that, it was painted orange. So there was a lot of care taken for safety, as Brian Corey does, right? So that uh, that part was pretty cool. So what were the skills utilized at this match? Skills utilized. So I would say moving quickly uh, through a stage, running over natural terrain, and then uh, um, depending on the option you chose, it was either quick loads on the shotgun because there was not super large arrays or shooting very small targets with your pistol <laughs> uh, that were pretty close. Uh, there were some... Far-ish slug, sh slug shots, 75 and 100 yards. Far-ish pistol shots, 75 and 100 yards. Um, and there were slug pistol options that were like 60 yards. So I would say long pistol targets, which I'm not very good at. Uh, they always hit low enough left with my Glock for some reason. Uh, and then I would say mid to long range 
uh, targets because there were a lot of stages where there were long, uh, air quote, long targets mm-hmm. being past 200 yards, but only one stage where they got out to 470 yards. Okay. Yeah. So those were skills utilized. And is this one of those matches where you get all slung up and loaded for bear and no. like shed your clothes as you go or is it no. all? No. So the, the rifle was always last except for that one stage I just described where the rifle was first and that was a 50 yard plate rack. Other than that, the rifle was always last. So you started with your, your shotgun stage, rifle staged and pistol in your holster, shot pistol, shot shotgun, shot rifle, or some variation of that, right? Mm-hmm. Rifle was always last. Mm-hmm. And obviously the idea there is that they can clear all those other guns, paste all those other targets, and by the time you're done shooting, the whole stage is reset, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, moving on to farthest shot, because that kind of blends into here. Mm-hmm. So there were four long-range stages, long being over 200 yards, and I liked, I liked the longness of of uh, these these targets mm-hmm. because I think sometimes we're like, oh, let's go ahead and shoot six hundred and five, six hundred and twenty yards with two two three, and then that just becomes silly, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, six hundred yards with the two two three is an achievable shot, not necessarily a wise shot, right? Mm-hmm. In, in like a a real sort of situation, only tool you have, yeah. I mean, by all means, go for it, right? But at that point, it's like, nah. I think I enjoy the speed of the game. Mm-hmm. And if you have targets from 150 to 300 yards, uh, some people I've talked to said that they'd make 220, 250 yards the max uh, to keep it speedy and then just put people in, like, awkward positions. So, but this this match, let's see your thoughts on that. We'll come back to that. Yeah. So this match, there was a... Uh, one stage with 470, 293, 222, 306, 235, and 270. Uh, uh, yeah. And that was from a minivan, which was the nicest. Which is the best place to shoot long range from. It was the nicest uh, minivan that I've ever shot from. Didn't stink like hell. The They put a nice carpet in there. So it was did like they, a nice shooting did position. They, did they like leave in it and go home? Yes. Then <laughs> so somebody somebody's grocery getter was yes. on that. Nice. Yeah, pretty much. It was the arrows. <laughs> and then the uh uh there was another stage with two seventy six, one thirty seven, two fifteen, and three fourteen. Another stage with one forty four, one ninety four, one seventy yards. And there was another one uh that was on the golf course, which is really cool shooting on a golf course. And that was between there was five targets between two hundred and ten and two hundred and seventy yards. And there was one stage I didn't even bother uh, writing down the the distances just because they were all dead holds, but there was like four targets and they were probably like 160 to 210 or something like that. Mm-hmm. Man, it'd almost be worth it just to shoot on a golf course. Yeah, it was cool. All all my all my years in motocross, I always wanted to ride dirt bikes on a golf course. I know. So maybe this is the closest. Yeah, you got to shoot get. rifle, pistol, and shotgun on the golf course. Did you have uh, to fix your divot when you were done? No, well, no, that's they good. did not. You did not have to that's fix your divot. The, that's for the birds. The shooting position was the hole six sign the what the sign that says what hole it is oh yeah shooting position was from the sign is that why all the short guys were upset well there was a yes is the answer to that question uh so that would have been a good standing position but there was also a reverse kneel position that was just two two by fours um put into like a square that was screwed off the edge of the sign Really? And that reverse kneel position was too tall for a lot of the short guys. And one of those famous short guys timed out. Hmm. Well, that's unfortunate. <laughs> and Oh, and you can go prone on that stage. You can't go prone. It was in the stage description. You may not go prone. Hmm. And, and it was probably because you had your pistol on you. Shenanigans. Shenanigans? Why? I don't know. Oh. It's like it's too tall for the short guys, but you can't go prone. Double kneel. Ah, uh, well, yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that's the problem, right? Is if if it's too if it's too tall for you to reverse kneel, double kneel, and then shut and up. Obviously, use your <laughs> use your silo as well. Mm. Or wait, is silo still a thing? I don't know. 
only person I see running it is Rob Romero. You mean Tate? Nope. Oh, really? Rob Romero. That dude from the Novesky shooting team, Ninja I've, Cop? I'm aware. I'm aware. <laughs> <laughs> no, I spend a lot of time with Rob Tate, and he's, he's, a, he's a fan as well. Oh, really? Of the silo? Uh, oh, yes. Huh. I haven't shot with him. Well, since Texas. I mean, I don't think he had it there. I think the only time Rob's shooting without his silo is when someone says he can't. Interesting. I don't know. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, where are we at? We're at logistics. We are. So logistics. Uh, check-in was pretty easy if you had already signed up, which I didn't. So it was a little longer for me, but it still was brief considering we start from scratch. Scoring was updated each evening. Um, you did get a T-shirt, which was cool. They looked really nice. Although I didn't get a t-shirt because I signed up late. Uh, yeah, like I said, practice score was up, updated each evening. Prize table walk was uh, quick and easy. They did a um, like a little mention of where the uh, trophies came from, which were brought by the Brazilians who come from Brazil. And they, <laughs> <laughs> Do they now? Yeah. <laughs> and they, they brought like uh, Olympic medal style. Uh, trophies, which is really cool. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so they've been there every year for the Pro-Am, and I think a few of them come to uh, Blue Ridge as well. And it was it was really cool to see them provide the uh, the trophies. It was really nice. One of the guys I talked to said that he was born in the wrong country and that he, val- he uh, values mine, and he's glad that I let him come here. Seems like something a terrorist would say. <laughs> I kid, I kid, <laughs> but but always be vigilant. <laughs> <laughs> That's not nice. <laughs> All right, so we're at venue. I think we've been talking about venue this whole yeah, time. Yeah, venue, Rock House Shooting Facility. For those of you who don't know, it's a 2,000-acre facility in Park City, Kentucky that backs to a national park. There's a hotel, straight, again, straight out of Dirty Dancing. There's uh, Hotel uh, Bates parking lot where all the uh, shenanigans and the good stuff happens. They have a winery, a bar, a restaurant, uh, and multiple options for shooting three gun uh, in, in long range, like in, in Thunder Valley, mm-hmm. uh, or actual long range out to like 1,600 yards. They have a cowboy town, the aforementioned Turbacker Barn, four bay stages, sporting clays. Uh, they, oh, another thing I noticed they have is a... Uh, walking archery range, 3D archery range, which is kind of cool. It's like sporting clays for people that shoot bows and arrows. Mm-hmm. And it's about 90 minutes from Nashville, Tennessee, which is the closest airport. And they have a bathhouse. They have a bathhouse. So yeah, the bathhouse, I don't know if I watch too much TV or whatever, but bathhouse to me brings up weird things like, oh, yeah, it's over by the bathhouse it's in the middle of the woods. So you go over there, and there's literally a bathhouse in the middle of the woods. You're like, why is this thing here? I have no clue, but now that the Nobles own the place, we get to shoot from and on that bathhouse. It is my favorite part of the entire facility. Really? Yes. Interesting. So there was like a massive hornet's nest and bees and snakes in the, in the uh, bathhouse, and guess who got to reset the whole time in there for the squad? That's right, me. As soon as I mentioned snake, DJ's like, you're in there. <laughs> <laughs> I got the lions and tigers and bears. You take care of the snakes and the hornets yeah, in there. But he's under the barrel. Who cares? <laughs> yeah, so that was kind of sketchy. But, yeah, the bathhouse is pretty cool. It's it's like just a, uh, I don't know how you describe it, just like a shower house in the middle of the woods. I would woods. describe it as a latrine from every church and Boy Scout camp you've ever been to. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That's why I don't understand when they call it a bathhouse and I got there. I was like, oh, it's just a latrine. Oh, that's yeah. cool. It's just a toilet. Yeah. yeah. So then uh, there's a, like a hatch on the roof and you can shoot into the bathhouse in certain targets, right? So mm-hmm. that's what we did in this. In this match it was pretty cool. Yep. I don't. I don't wear. I don't wear a uh, uniform professionally, so I never get to shoot inside of buildings. Oh yeah. So whenever they let me go in there and shoot stuff, I always think that's. I think it's cool. Yeah. So this one you got to shoot from the roof. I've never shot from. Also, the don't get to do that. I've never shot from the entryway. Do you get to do that sometimes? Shot from the entryway. Yeah, like from the door. You can go in from the door or the roof. Uh, Blue Ridge, they usually let us like run in the door and just like throw 180 to the breeze and yeah. hose stuff in there. Yeah, because they're uh, center blocks to stop all the cartridges. Yeah, and they got the these bolts. cool like 
bullet traps too. Yeah, they have really nice bullet traps for sure. So I always, I don't know. It's one of those feels like I always feel super naughty when I'm in there doing all the stuff that that Eddie Eagle tells me not to. Exactly. So. All right. So and then what was pre communication? I think you touched on that a yeah, little bit. Touched already. on that just a little bit. But one thing I wanted to mention is that uh, they they being Rock Castle put out a Facebook and Instagram post. What? That was a update from the match director. And it was, you know, imagine the best Mike Sexton voice. Nah, hell yes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Mike. But uh, it was, uh, th- this is what we put on the ground. This is what you can expect. Uh, don't need to bring a sling. You do need to bring this. Blah, 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 blah. And it was in a Facebook post and an Instagram post, and I saw both of them. So that was pretty cool. So to, who's uh, doing all the work? Who's doing all the work? What do you mean? Like when I when I'm match directing, ain't got ain't got time for oh, that. That was on the the Rock Castle Shooting Center website or uh, Facebook page and Instagram. So it was likely Nick Noble. Oh, likely. I don't know that for sure. So Mike has people for that. Everybody's got people for that. Yeah, man. All right. So how was the staff? Staff was great. A um, lot of a lot of the usual suspects. Uh, Were they from Kentucky? Some were from Kentucky. Some were imported. Uh, since Mike was there, he brought a lot of his uh, ROs that he's used to shooting with, which uh, is one of the reasons that Heath, Heath Clevenger was there. Uh, uh, I will say that a quite a few people mentioned, "Don't trip, watch your step." You know, so a lot I mean, of people. I mean, that one's going to take at least eighteen months to live down. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I don't. I'm not. I don't need to live it down. No, no, that's fine. Yeah, but it's it's entwined in your identity now. Yeah, totally. It, it's a pretty funny video too. So it is. I yeah. watched it. I did too, buddy. I just found the GoPro. I can show you that later. <laughs> uh, so what would you call the fun factor of this one? Let's see. Oh, hang on. One more. Mo- one, you had one more. Minute. You had more staff. Yeah. So there was there was one stage where the uh, the sun was rising, and we had to targets out to two hundred yards. Mm-hmm. Uh, the ROs were just putting their hands above their eyebrows. And watching the targets, and they missed a couple of hit calls. Are those on one those of our Kentucky shooters. binoculars on one of our shooters. So the shooter spoke to uh, higher match staff, mm-hmm. and I was like, "Well, I'll be honest. I can I cannot see those targets adequately, and I have thirty seven year old eyes. These guys should have binoculars." And then I noticed that one of the guys did have binoculars, but just was not using them. Ooh. So he was directed thereafter to use binoculars. So, that so, did, was, so did that guy get a reshoot then? He did not. He did not. Mm-mm. But start using the binoculars now. Yes. Yeah. It's uh, those are always those are always tough calls to make, and I mean I wasn't there, but I, I have I have shot at at um, at Rock Castle before. And the first stage of the day in Thunder Valley. Yeah. And because well, you're shooting into the sun. And yeah. And we're like, in fact, it was the Bryans who were ROing that stage. And they're like, yeah, y'all, we're just going to like pretend not to look at our watches for like a half hour if that's cool with you. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> it was, it was, uh, it was bad. The, the, the shadow over the hill is really bad. And, and yeah. I was freaking out the whole time. Like, man, I can't see those things. I just can't. Were you limited so, division at the time? No, no. I was okay. shooting with a scope. I just wasn't any good. <laughs> but, you know, it's, yeah. But, yeah, I don't know. I mean, because it's, you know, calling hits, like, it, we're still human. Yeah, right? absolutely. You, know, you can make a mistake. It's, it's hard. It's hard. And, and th- so that's what I'm saying is, like, it's it's difficult. So <laughs> I would use every tool given to me, you know, because I want to be sure. I don't want to be the guy that doesn't call a hit when there's a hit or vice versa. And there's plenty of shooter who's turned around and said, I hit that, and they did not hit that. So that is is a tough situation to be in. So on this particular shooter that I'm thinking of, Mm -hmm. there were two targets that he contested, Mm -hmm. and it was a split decision. One he hit, and they did not call hit. One he did not hit, and they did not call hit. Oh. Yeah. Because we we had video. well. Well, I mean, yeah, all was well, but um, there would not have been an argument if they were using glass. True. 
They're, well, they're right. clo- they're close enough together that because some sometimes it's hard to use glass on a long range because they're because you got to find them. Yeah. Or whatever you know. Yeah. They're, so that you know, just having the binoculars isn't isn't the only answer. No, I hear you. So that's that's an interesting scenario. So along with the match, one of the cool things that happened this match. So I mentioned uh, Chad Francis and David Power, right? Uh, range master, executive match staff, whatever you want to call them, right? There's usually hierarchies of match staff, executive match staff, and then range officers, right? We should do a we should do a cast on that. We should. <laughs> so, David Power and Chad Francis, they they met and became friends at Blue Ridge Pro Am, RO in those matches, right? Mm-hmm. Um, very first Pro Am. Katie Francis was, with Chad's daughter, was uh, a, an RO at like, I don't know, 13 or something? Mm-hmm. Something like that. However long ago we decided the, the program started. Mm-hmm. Uh, David Power's son, Wyatt, also was, you know, RO at some point, right? Mm-hmm. So Wyatt Power and Katie Power, or Katie Power, Katie Francis were CROs on a couple stages. So, like, the torch has been passed, right? Mm -hmm. It was pretty cool. So, when you were saying, like, did you get to hear David Power call a hit? No, but I got to hear Wyatt Power do it, which was cool. Does he do it the same? It's, uh, you know, I don't know, because I've never been on a stage where David Power has called a hit. I've heard him do it, like, for the podcast. Like, Jeff Fox, where these kids can tell me a redneck (laughs) joke, but it's not going to be the same. (laughs) But the, uh, but uh, what I'm saying is Wyatt and... Katie killed it, and it was cool to see them them do that. And, like, the – I don't know. I, I feel like passing the love of the game and the respect for the game and the desire to help other people mm-hmm. in the game mm-hmm. along from generation to generation is a really cool thing. Yes. So I that, definitely was, agree with that, that was one thing that was really exciting. I've, def- and and I've definitely watched calls. that from the sidelines with Katie. I haven't – I don't – I couldn't pick Wyatt out of a lineup. So. Oh, yeah. Well – just keep your ears peeled, and he sounds exactly like his dad. <laughs> <laughs> He's funny like his dad too. It's cool. <laughs> so this is a this is a fun fun factor. This is a totally fun match. It was a good time. I really enjoyed it. The uh, uh, stages were well laid out. There were quick stages. They uh, had plenty of opportunity to um to gain time by moving faster, which I like. I like that about matches, you know, and. I do as well. Yeah. I, I would definitely shoot this one again for sure. This is a good match. Funny things that happened in the match. My buddy DJ Petro, his open shotgun went down, which is weird because it's it runs every time. You know, they always say that. They do. And then it seems like they're always saying that when their shotguns aren't working. Yeah, he like broke a bolt or something and <laughs> had to borrow one from the Brazilians. Luckily, the most of the Brazilians shoot open. So. <laughs> <laughs> the Brazilians imported parts into the country. <laughs> no, they actually. I'm not going to comment because I don't know. The, I don't know the the details of that. Oh yeah, I was just kidding. I didn't. I don't want to get that. They might. They might have. I don't want to get the Brazilian not terrorists. They might be using loaner guns. True. Yeah. Which is perfectly legal. Right. So, uh, and then other funny things. Just random parking lot shenanigans again. It took me an hour to get from my truck to the front of the uh, the Rock Castle. Oh, uh, oh! Another side opportunity. They had a cornhole tournament to benefit Generation Three Gun. A what now? Cornhole. So, like throwing uh, sandbags in sandbags. It's sandbags, right? Was there a flood? All right, not that. We got to wrap this up. Stop dragging <laughs> this shit on, man. You know what I'm talking about? Cornhole. <laughs> no, I don't. You don't? No. Jesus Christ. <laughs> that so does it, sound like something I would pretend, but in do fact, you, I'm oblivious. Do you oblivious. go to social events that are not shooting related? What? <laughs> So it's a game where there's boards set up and each of the boards has a hole and you stand on either side like horseshoes and you toss bean bags. That's what I was looking for. You toss bean bags oh. into the hole. Do you know what I'm talking about now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, cornhole. Yeah, we don't call it cornhole. What do you call it? Tossing bags? <laughs> yeah, we should toss the bean bags into the <laughs> hole. Jesus Christ. I'm like, no, Grandma, I don't want to play. Yeah, we don't call it football. Can we play we call Xbox it, now? We call it throwing the pigskin around. The what? Oh, no, we could never say that up here. That would hurt somebody's feelings. 
<laughs> so anyway, the yeah, fun factor. The funny things that happen in the match, generally all in the parking lot. It's good times. We shall never speak of them again. <laughs> On the mic. Correct. <laughs> well, I don't know, Dave. I mean, I have to say, Pro Am gets a lot of flack from years past. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say, For I what? was uh, random thing. We're trying to wrap it up. All right. <laughs> but so I've, but heard, uh, I've I've heard lots of things, and it was nowhere near on my radar screen at all mm -hmm. um, two hours ago. But I mean, based on what some of the stuff you've talked about, yeah. maybe maybe it's something I should consider for next year. You might have changed my mind. Well, so so I I had not had this on my radar either because I heard same things. A lot of mm -hmm. flack. You know, it's a party with a match attached. Right, that's what I had heard. Mm -hmm. But when they brought on Brian Corey and Mike Sexton, I know those guys' reputation from other matches, and I knew that it would be a good match because it's a great venue. They have a great canvas to paint on, right? Mm -hmm. So I was not disappointed. I would go shoot it again, and I think that. So I, I was not at those previous Rock Castle matches or Rock Castle Prime matches, but from the people that I've spoken to that were, they did an excellent job of of turning it around. So. Thumbs up. Yeah. Well, that's that's definitely uh, definitely what we were hoping to hear when we heard that uh, the guard was changing a little bit yeah. on it. So uh, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Good times. So that, Adam, is the match recon of the Rock Castle Pro-Am for 2017. This is probably the longest match recon we've ever done. 90 minutes, buddy. I don't know how I feel about that. I mean, there, it was, it was action-packed. I think I we, we got a lot of good stuff in there. I mean, there's about five minutes you're going to have to trim out of there, but I think if we trim it down to just the match stuff, it's probably about 32 minutes worth of podcast. <laughs> so we got two episodes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this, uh, as, as always, Adam, it's a good time to, uh, to do this with you. So I appreciate you uh, uh, being here and participating in it and bringing up the, uh, the interesting topics and side tangents. There we go. Just the Andy Richter of the Three Gun Show. <laughs> <laughs> You're my Conan. <laughs> hey, before you take off, be sure to check out the show notes at threegunshow.com for links to things that we discussed in the podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Armalite, the original. Armalite rifles put the AR in AR-15. The rifles themselves come with 1 and 8 twist barrels, match barrels 18-inch or 13.5-inch with a 15-inch uh, or 12.5-inch handguard. Timney trigger, Luth AR stock, adjustable uh, gas system, tunable comp, a patented tunable comp. This thing's ready to go right out of the box for a three-gun with no additional modifications other than putting on a nice optic. I, myself... Use a Vortex Viper PST 1 to 6 when I'm shooting Tac Ops or their Spitfire when I'm shooting Limited. Check them out at Armalite.com. A quick reminder that if you enjoyed this podcast, consider supporting the show on Patreon for as little as $5 per month. That's like three rounds of 9mm per episode. Patreon.com slash 3 show. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Unload show clear.